All right. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think most of you have been here before, but just in case, um, everything will get um, recorded and archived onto our website and should be up there by tomorrow. And so if you want to request CEUs, you can do that through our um, virtual CEU request. And then that usually just takes me a couple of days to get that back to you. So um, webinar Wednesdays, we have booked through February now. So the next round should be coming up soon. I'll get that info out to you. Um, the next one that we have advertised though um, is, is it the 30th of December? Is it? I believe so. Yes. And that's Dr. Bieberdorf is going to talk about some vision services and things for brain injury. Um, but today we have Kylie Overson with us. She's an associate attorney with Schneider Law of Fargo, um, and they represent social security disability clients across North Dakota. So we wanted her to kind of share some of her insights with us. So welcome, Kylie. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Carly, and excited to be with this group um, and, and talk a little bit about the process of applying for social security disability. Um, it's, it's not an easy process. And so today is really a, a big picture overview. I, I try not to get into the weeds too much, but there is a lot of technical, um, technical terms and I'll explain that as we go. And throughout the presentation, if you have questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, if it's appropriate, if it makes sense to stop and answer the question at that time, I'll do that. Otherwise we'll catch up on questions at the end. Um, but happy to have this be more conversational as we go throughout. So it's not just me talking at you. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, is that show? Okay. So as Carly said, my name's Kylie. I work at Schneider Law Firm, um, one of Social Security is our primary focus, I would say, and we are one of the very few law firms in the state that focuses on Social Security disability applications and appeals. And here we go. So this is sometimes um, those people who are applying for Social Security disability, um, this often is what it feels like. It's, it's a maze. There are a lot of different steps that it takes to get there. Um, it's, it's often confusing and repetitive and when you are, especially when you get to the point of having to go through an administrative hearing, um, it is nearly impossible to do that without an attorney by your side. And so, um, that's why we're here. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges we see, especially with people who have been working in the past is that there is, there's often um, some embarrassment or shame about having to apply for benefits. It's not something that people want to have to do in their lifetime. Um, but, you know, we always encourage our clients that these are benefits that you have, and most workers have paid into the system. You are entitled to these benefits. Or if you are someone who hasn't been able to work and you're applying for SSI, that is exactly what these programs were designed for. And so there is, there's no shame in asking for help when you need it. And we, you know, we think Social Security is a really important program. So a brief outline of what we'll talk about, explaining the difference between the two Social Security disability programs. We'll go through the claims process, the adjudication process, and then we'll talk briefly about appealing into federal court, which is the last shot at getting benefits. So with that, so the two different types of social security benefits, supplemental security income, um, this is what we would consider the safety net program. Um, individuals who are applying for SSI generally don't have a lot of mm -hmm. work um, and SSI is income and asset controlled as well. So meaning you have to have under a certain amount of assets and you can't have a certain amount of income. Um, and that will include anyone who lives in your household, um, spouse, if you live with a parent, if you live with a roommate, um, they will look at all of that as a, as a whole picture if you're applying for SSI. 
Um, on the flip side, Social Security Disability Insurance, um, you must have sufficient work credits to qualify. It's, you know, SSDI is, is truly an insurance program. So while you are working, you are earning those work credits, you are paying into the system in order to gain access to those insurance benefits. Um, there is no asset limit for SSDI, but you can't be engaging in what we call substantial gainful activity. Uh, meaning you can't be earning over a certain amount of money on a monthly basis from working in order to still qualify for SSDI. And the benefit amount, you know, will often get asked, well, if I apply and if I'm approved, how much am I going to get every month? Um, that depends on your personal earnings record. There's not a set amount. Um, it depends on how much you've earned in the past and your benefit will be based off of those earnings. So one concept to understand in looking at the two different programs is what we call the date or the last date insured, date last insured. Um, this only applies to the disability insurance side, not the supplemental security side. And this is the date on which you have to prove you are disabled on or before. And so it, you can think about it like paying for car insurance premiums. If you pay your premiums every month, and the last month you pay is in December, in January, you will no longer be covered, right? And so with disability insurance, it's the same type of concept in that while you're working, you're paying into the system. And so the credits that you're earning only go so far into the future if you stop working. And so when we're talking to a client and um, trying to assess if it's a case that we can take and if they might be eligible for SSDI, we often need to find their date last insured if they haven't worked for, for some years. Um, generally speaking, if you've worked for the past five years, you'll have coverage you know, at some point into the future. Um, if it's been more than five years since you last work, worked, um, you might not have that disability insurance coverage um, into the future. It might be a date in the past. And so that's something we have to walk through on a case by case basis. So the claims process, the first step in securing social security disability benefits is applying through the initial application. Um, and that's something you can do over the phone, online, you can go to a social security office. Well, when COVID is not um, impacting office hours, you could go in person. Um, the, the initial application I wouldn't say is, is easy, but most, people do that initial application on their own or with the help of um, sometimes an advocate or a spouse or a doctor, social worker. Um, typically, from the attorney perspective, we won't get involved in the initial application um, unless it's a very complex case. Um, claimants will usually do that part on their own. Um, about a third of the claims are approved at that initial application phase. Um, a vast majority of claims, especially for individuals who are under the age of 50, are denied at that first application. Um, and that's just the way Social Security processes things. Um, so once you get that first denial, you then apply for what is called reconsideration. And that is just another paper application. You know, you submit the, the request for reconsideration, the same office, um, and these are state agencies. So through the Department of Human Services, um, working with Social Security Administration rules, apply, um, reviews your initial application and your reconsideration request. Um, and then as you can see, 13% of the claims are approved at the reconsideration level. So we're still you know, under the 50% mark of claims being approved before you get to a hearing. And even with the reconsideration, I'd say that's also a phase that a lot of people go through on their own without an attorney. And it's possible to do that. You're, you're just submitting a request to the office. Um, there's no legal argument at that phase. So if you've been denied at your initial application and then denied a reconsideration, the next part is going to an administrative hearing. Um, that first or that um, reconsideration denial, you'll have 60 days after you get that documentation to request a hearing. The wait time for when you make that request until you actually get in front of administrative law judge um, varies a lot. Um, 
I think, you know, the numbers that I have up here, are, I think are from 2019, but it's usually between 12 to 15 months, I'd say right now, where they're scheduling hearings out. So it's a long process to wait for that hearing to be scheduled. Um, typically, those hearings take place in person in front of a judge or the judge is appearing over video conference, depending on where you live. Um, if you are in Grand Forks, for example, the hearing is usually over video conference because the judges are based in Fargo and in Sioux Falls. Right now, all of our hearings are taking place over the phone um, and will be for at least another two months. Um, I think we've been doing phone hearings since April um, and those are not ideal for disability proceedings, but um, it, it's worked. We haven't noticed an impact on hearing decisions because of them being over the phone. And so you have your administrative hearing. This is when you'll have the administrative judge hearing your, your testimony. It's your chance as a claimant to kind of share your story um, and how the medical evidence that the judge is looking at really impacts your day-to-day -day life. And this is the part where you need to have an attorney. Um, you, can, you can show up at a hearing by yourself and you can attempt to go through that. Um, there are some judges who will say, you need to go get a lawyer, come back, we'll reschedule the hearing. Some judges will let you attempt to do it on your own, um, but it's, it's really a, a technical process once you get to the hearing phase um, and really difficult to do that without an attorney or an advocate. Um, at the hearing stage, if you receive a denial, if the administrative law judge says, no, I don't think that you are disabled and entitled to benefits, um, the next step is what we call the appeals council. And that is the last administrative step. And that is also a paper review or a file review. You don't appear in front of, of, of the appeals council. They just review your application, the administrative law judge's decision and either uphold that decision or remand it for a further hearing. Um, similarly, this can be up to two years. Usually, I, I'd say about 12 to 18 months is what we're expecting for the Appeals Council decision. Um, an important note on this, once you've submitted that request to the Appeals Council, that is still a part of the administrative process, so you cannot submit a new application for benefits while that is still pending. So if you have, you know, gone through all of these steps, the Appeals Council is looking at your claim, you can't submit a new application. The only exception being if you have a new critical or disabling condition that started after your administrative hearing. Um, you know, an example would be if you, if you get a cancer diagnosis or some other significant impairment that occurs after your administrative hearing then you can make a request to submit that new application. Okay, and at the hearing level, this is what you know. I noticed, or I said earlier, that it's it's really important to have an attorney for that. The um, government has estimated that claimants with the representative are three times more likely to be awarded benefits if they are working with an attorney at that stage. Um, and the, the reason, of course, is that this process is complicated and the definition of disability um, in federal law is applied strictly by law judges. You know, they have to follow a very clear set of rules when they're making that decision. The definition of disability is the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity by reason of a medically determinable physical or mental impairment, which can be expected to result in death or which has lasted or can be expected to last for a continuous period of not less than 12 months. And so what that means is, under Social Security's rules, there is no partial disability and there is no short-term disability. Um, with private insurance companies, sometimes there's a short-term disability policy or a partial disability. You know, the v VA, for example, has partial disability ratings. Under Social Security, either you are fully 100% disabled and unable to work or you're not. Um, the I guess caveat to that would be that there's sometimes is what we what we'd consider a closed period of benefits, 
Um, and that's when the impairment has lasted longer than 12 months, but it does improve. Um, and that might be sometimes that close period happens before you ever get to a hearing stage. So we might get to the hearing stage and say, judge, there was this 18 month period where um, the claimant was unable to work. The claimant has since returned to work, but would like benefits for that 18 month period where they were unable to work. So you can look into the past or look into the future um, to identify and define that close period. Um, Social Security, rightly or wrongly, assumes that working families have access to other resources to provide support during periods of short-term disability, which might include workers' compensation, insurance, savings, or investments. Um, the reality that we know is that most working families don't have access to those types of programs, so I think that's um, a shortcoming of the Social Security program is that they don't have those partial or short-term options. So thinking about what exactly Social Security and the judge are going to be looking at once you're applying for benefits, they go through what is called the five-step sequential evaluation, um, which is just a big way of saying there are five, five steps and five considerations that Social Security will, will look at to consider to determine whether you meet the definition of disability. The first hurdle to clear is looking at your work activity, determining if the applicant is engaging in substantial gainful activity, um, which we'll go through a little bit more. Then second, you look at the severity of the impairments, both mental and physical. You consider whether the impairments meet or equal a listing. Uh, this is what we call a light switch. You know, if you need a listing, a light switch is flipped, you automatically meet disability and the process stops. Um, we'll explain that a little bit more. Um, next, you will look at what the claimant's residual functional capacity is and what their past relevant work is. And then finally, um, if they can no longer do their past work, the judge or the administration will consider whether you can adjust to other work, taking into account your age, education, and work experience. So step one, substantial gainful activity. Um, Social Security, the SGA level varies every year. In 2020, $1,260 is the SGA level. So if you are working still and earning over that amount, you are automatically considered not disabled. And it has to be earned income. You know, if it's, if it's some other type of compensation, um, spousal support, for example, or um, you're receiving financial income from some other source besides actually working hours and being paid for those hours. Um, if you're working that amount and earning over 1260, you are automatically disqualified from disability benefits. Um, so that means if you are working and earning $800 a month, you might still qualify for disability. Um, so there's sometimes a misconception that you can't be working at all to qualify for disability, but that's not accurate. You can still be earning some amount of income and apply for and earn social security disability benefits. Um, there's a few other exceptions too to that amount. An unsuccessful work attempt. So if you had stopped working, you attempt to return to work. That work lasts for six months or less and you stopped working because of your impairment. So you tried to return to work, your physical or mental impairment prohibited you from maintaining that work, that would be considered an unsuccessful work attempt. And Social Security looks at all of that very carefully, how much you were earning, how long you were working, why is it that you stopped working? Um, the other thing to consider is a wage subsidy. Um, if your earnings are being subsidized by your employer, by the government, by a, a nonprofit agency, that won't be considered substantial gainful activity if you're over the level of 1260. And again, that amount changes every year. Um, so after you get past that first hurdle of showing that you are not engaging in substantial, substantial gainful activity, 
then Social Security will look at the impairments that you have and the severity of those impairments. So, for example, um, sometimes we'll have clients who apply for disability and they will list 15 or 20 different impairments. And that might be, you know, high blood pressure, that might be heart problems, that might be um, problems breathing, or might be specific back problems. You might, you know, all of these things that are technically in your medical records that you've been treated for, not all of them will be considered severe impairments, even if it's something that you are diagnosed with or that appears on your medical records. Social Security has to determine if it's severe. And an impairment is considered severe if it significantly limits your physical or mental abilities to do basic work activity. So if you get to step two and you don't have any severe medically determinable impairments, meaning you might have a lot of symptoms, but no specific diagnosis, um, nothing, no objective tests showing that something is wrong physically or mentally, um, Social Security will find that there are no medically determinable impairments and you won't be able to move on to the next step. The next step, and this is um, step three, the listings, Social Security will consider whether your impairments meet or equal a listing. There's a listing of, of specific types of impairments that Social Security considers. It's very rare that claimants meet a listing, but an example would be um, if you have a very specific diagnosis of degenerative disc disease and that diagnosis limits your ability to engage in XYZ and your records show you know, these very specific findings, then they will find that you meet that disability definition right off the bat and they stop the process and you're awarded benefits. Um, sometimes you might equal a listing and the best example of that is narcolepsy. Um, or an example of that, narcolepsy isn't something that Social Security defines in their listings, but they would find that it is equal to the impairment of epilepsy. Um, so if you have a very specific diagnosis of narcolepsy, you have medical evidence to prove it, you know that it impacts you in these certain ways, and you can show that, it's likely that you would meet the listing for epilepsy, which again, that switched, you know, that's the light switch. If you meet that definition, you have those specific steps, the process stops and you're considered to have met the definition of disability. Again, those cases are very rare, but it does happen. So assuming you don't meet a listing, you go on to step four, which is your residual functional capacity. Um, just more, more legal jargon that means this is the assessment of what you can and cannot do. So your functional capacity looks at all of the exertional limits you might have and non-exertional limits that you might have based on your medical impairments. So based on the evidence and your testimony, they're going to look at your ability to engage in sitting, in standing, in walking, lifting, carrying objects, pushing or pulling. Um, so for example, you might say that a claimant is able to walk for four hours out of an eight hour workday and can sit for six hours out of an eight hour workday, can lift up to 20 pounds frequently, um, 50 pounds occasionally. Um, and so each of those things that the judge has to make a specific finding on what exactly you can engage in, the maximum amount of activity you can do. And then they also look at the non-exertional limitations that you might have. So that's postural, uh, manipulative, which is using your hands and arms, um, your visual impairments, if you have any communicative, meaning hearing and speaking, and then mental limitations. And that can be you know, listening to instructions, following instructions, um, dealing appropriately with other people, and then environmental factors. Um, hot or cold environments sometimes are preclusive of, of work activity, um, different scents if you have allergies, 
um, working around moving machinery, working on heights. Those are all considered environmental factors. So once you have that capacity assessment, the judge makes this finding of, you know, this is the maximum amount of activity that you can engage in. Then you look at your past work. So if this is an individual who has worked numerous jobs over the years, the judge has to identify the types of jobs that were performed and find that because of your impairments, you could not engage in that past relevant work. Um, and so if at that point the judge says there's this job you did as an administrative assistant 10 years ago, it's sedentary, it was an unskilled job, you can still do that job based on your limitations, case closed. If you can still do past work that you've had, um, you will be, find, will be found not disabled. Um, and past work, there's also, a, of course, the definition of that, and that's work that you've performed within 15 years prior to the date of the hearing or the determination. The job must have lasted long enough for you to be able to learn to do it. So if you only worked at a job for a week or two, it won't be considered past relevant work. And you have to have been performing it at substantial gainful activity levels, so earning enough for it to count. So sometimes part-time work won't be included because you didn't earn over SGA levels. Um, and this part can be a little confusing, but Social Security has to determine that you can perform that past work both as you actually performed it, as you did the job, and how it's generally performed in the national economy. Um, so the job of a cleaner or housekeeper, you might have performed it at a really light level, meaning, you know, they didn't make you lift anything, they didn't make you push the heavy cart, but generally speaking, a job that's performed like that in other places requires those things. They have to show that you can both, you can't perform it like you actually did it and how it might have been performed in another type of job setting. Um, and this is where we'll have a, there's a vocational expert who appears at hearings and talks about all of those different requirements of different types of jobs and defines the jobs that you've done in the past. Um, big picture at step four, your past work is more important when the individual applying is over the age of 50. Um, generally, when you're under the age of 50, you have to be found incapable of unskilled sedentary work. So that is the, you know, the most simple job you can think of. There are no physical requirements. Um, the best example we like to use is a ticket taker. You know, you're in a ticket booth at a parking lot. You are able to sit all day. There's no lifting. You're, there's no real skill required there. You're just taking tickets from people or taking money from people and giving them a ticket. So that really easy transaction and the limited skill level, that would be an unskilled sedentary level job. So if you're under the age of 50, you most likely have to show that because of your physical and mental impairments, you can't perform that kind of job. And you have to be able to do a job like that on a regular and continuing basis, meaning eight hours a day, five days a week, um, or something similar to that. If you could only do it four hours a day, five days a week, that wouldn't be considered um, that you, that wouldn't be considered capable of performing work. So it has to be full time, regular work. And then finally, at step five of this evaluation, and this is um, where age really comes into play. Um, this is what we call the grids. And I'll show you a picture of this because it's, it's confusing. Um, but this is when the judge has to look at your past work, your age, and your education level and determine if based on that, you can adjust to other work that exists in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, often, especially in North Dakota, because we've got a lot of clients in rural areas, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I live out in, oh, in Northwood, or I live in Velva, North Dakota, and I'm miles away from any place where I could find a job. Social Security, generally speaking, doesn't care. 
Um, they're not looking at whether a job is available where you actually live. Um, it's whether jobs are available in the national economy. Um, so they'll look at what's called the, again, your RFC, your residual functional capacity, whether you're limited to medium, light, or sedentary level work based on your physical limitations. So um, an example, if you are age 55 or older, which is what they consider advanced age, um, you will be found disabled, even if your capacity shows that you could do unskilled light level work. And light work is generally speaking, either you're standing most of the day or you're required to lift up to 20 pounds on an occasional basis. So if you can stand on your feet all day or you can lift up to 20 pounds, you'll probably be found capable of light work. If you are over the age of 55, it's likely that you will be found disabled even if you still have that capacity. Um, however, if you're under the age of 55 and you can still do that light level work, Social Security will most likely find you not disabled based on the physical impairments. Um, and then another example is if you are closely approaching retirement age, which is anyone over the age of 60, even if you can perform medium level work, and that's, you know, that'll involve lifting up to 50 pounds, you'll be found disabled, even if you can perform that higher level of work. And so this, this next slide is, is what we call the grid. This is one of the grids. Um, and this is, <laughs> I'm showing it to you. It's, it's difficult to, to explain, but can you, can you see my mouse where I'm pointing? Okay, so you'll look, um, so advanced age. So, oops, if you're advanced age, age 50 to 54, um, your past education is that you're a high school graduate or more, and your previous work was unskilled, you would be found disabled if you're limited to sedentary work. <laughs> and so there's, there's three or four different grids like this where you look, so you determine what level of work you can do, what your age is, what your education level is, what your past work experience was skill-wise, and then you find the rule that correlates with that and it'll show you whether you are disabled or not disabled. Um, so those really come into play over the age of 50 um, and more so over the age of 55. So if you're a claimant who is under the age of 50, these grids don't apply because you have to show that you can't do unskilled sedentary work. So the grids don't really impact as much when you're under 50. Um, this is really getting into the weeds, but briefly, when you're over the age of 50, they're also going to be looking at transferable skills. So depending on the types of past work you've performed, they will determine if you have any skills. So if you did a medium level job, so heavy lifting, but you learned skills in that job that could transfer to a job that is sedentary or light, so there's no lifting requirement, but the skills are similar, um, that might impact the, the finding of disability. So, I'm um, gonna kind of skim through that part because it's a little too confusing for us here. So, um, another question we'll commonly get is what is the cost? If you are going to hire an attorney to go through this process of applying for disability, what is this going to cost me? Um, anyone who's representing an individual before the Social Security Administration cannot charge a fee unless that fee is explicitly approved by Social Security. Um, these are usually and almost always contingent fees, meaning we only get paid if our claimant is awarded benefits. So if we go through that whole process, which sometimes can take two years, but the claimant doesn't get benefits, we don't get paid. Um, generally that, that payment amount is 25% of your past do benefits. So if Social Security finds that your disability started two years before you actually get to the hearing, that two-year period is when you'll get past due benefits, your attorney would be awarded 25% of that lump sum amount. Um, you'd also be responsible for the costs associated. So that would be, you know, postage, 
um, filing into court if you end up in federal court, um, medical records, sometimes you get charged for requesting medical records, things like that. Usually the costs are very minimal though when you're going through a social security application. So you made it through the administrative hearing, you appealed to the appeals council and they still said, no dice, you're not disabled. Your last shot here is to file an appeal into federal court. Um, and so you finished the administrative process and now you're asking a federal judge or magistrate to look at this and overturn the administrative decision. The standard that they're looking at is substantial evidence on the record. So whether substantial evidence on the record does or does not support the decision of the administrative law judge. Um, the federal court has to consider all of the evidence on the file, including anything that was filed after your administrative hearing. Um, usually you're going to be looking for an error that the judge has made. Um, because the judges do sometimes make mistakes at the administrative level. Um, sometimes it's missing a diagnosis that was on your record and that you believe impacts your disability. Um, they didn't consider specific limitations that you have in making their capacity evaluation. Um, they disregarded the opinion of one of your treating doctors, um, things like that. So if there's an error, something that the judge failed to do or failed to consider, um, that's usually a good reason for appeal. So overall, applying for disability can be and often is overwhelming. Um, I'd say having a good attorney makes it go much more smoothly. smoothly. Um, there's no guarantee that you win. We at Schneider Law Firm would never tell you if you take this, if we take this case, you're guaranteed to win, um, but it makes it a lot easier and makes it a lot easier to follow the process and understand what Social Security is asking of you. Um, and to anyone who's considering applying or has applied in the past, you can always call our law firm with questions. Um, even if you're not an existing client, we often walk through and explain the process um, with people who are just calling um, whether or not we end up taking the, the case. Um, and I say this lightly, but don't always trust Social Security when you call. Um, sometimes they get the answers wrong. Um, and so it's sometimes helpful to get a second opinion if you call and they say, nope, you're not going to be eligible or nope, this is what you're looking at. Um, if you think that they're wrong, um, it's helpful to call someone and, and ask those additional questions. Um, and here we have a, a legal assistant named Ashley in our office who knows the process inside and out. Um, and she spends her all day, every day talking to people about social security disability and walking them through applications and reviewing medical records. And so um, you can call us anytime. Um, we do have offices in Fargo and Grand Forks, uh, but we represent clients all over North Dakota and all over Minnesota. Um, and there's, there's three attorneys here at the law firm. Um, so we, you know, we usually have capacity to help if it's a case that we, we can take. Um, so with that, I know that that was a lot and a lot of it was legal mumbo jumbo that is a little bit confusing. So I'm happy to answer any questions or go back through any part of that process um, if that's helpful. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Yeah, if you want to type your questions in the chat, or you can just simply unmute yourself and ask. Maybe I'm more comfortable. Uh, I do have a couple of questions or sure, things JP. anyways. Uh, one was on your graph was, yeah, or chart was the education level. Yep. Do they consider the fact that a person is a TBI survivor? And I've got a bachelor's degree and two associates. Mm -hmm. And I found where I was reading the book the next day, I'd have to go back because I couldn't even remember the darn thing. Yep. And so again, it, how much do they put into the education level? Because it may not mean a whole heck of a lot. Sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so they would be looking at you know, that as a non-exertional limitation, a mental limitation, and how that impacts your ability to do work. Um, generally, the mental requirements of work are going to be, you know, understanding and applying information, remembering, understanding, remembering, and applying information, um, 
receiving and following directions and supervision, interacting with other people, staying on task, um, maintaining concentration over a certain amount of time. So if you were to say, and you have you know, medical records that back that up, that you have a hard time remembering instructions or remembering things you have to do, um, that would absolutely play into whether or not you'd meet the definition of disability and your education level matters, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't negate the mental limitations you might have. Um, and again, it really gets at those, those grids. And so if you, if you're, it depends on your past work then too, but in that case, you'd likely be limited to unskilled work or less. And so then if you're limited to unskilled work, your education level doesn't matter. That was okay, a well, long answer to your question. According but... to my wife, yep. the redhead, <clears throat> <laughs> and yes, I, I should get your sympathy now. Uh, it seems that I can't remember to do anything that she asks me to do. So sure. I'm in deep kimchi. Um, anyways, the next thing I got is, it's kind of strange. Again, I work for the Border Patrol in a civilian capacity, and they put me at disability. Mm -hmm. And I have, was supposed to and did try to get disability social security. And what I found, or they, they uh, disapproved it. What I found funny, or one branch of the government says I'm disabled, <laughs> the other branch says no. It's just, yep. just kind of strange. It's <clears throat> totally strange <laughs> and super frustrating. And we see that a lot. Um, more so with, with veterans. You know, we'll often have veterans who have a disability rating through the VA and the Social Security Administration. Unfortunately, it does not have to follow that rating. They have to consider it and they have to consider the evidence that led to that rating or that finding, um, but they're not, they're not beholden to it. Um, and so I, I literally just last week appealed a decision into federal court or to the appeals council um, because the judge disregarded the VA <coughs> finding and didn't consider the medical evidence related to that finding and they're required to do that. So it's super frustrating. Um, I would say that that's a call your congressman moment. <laughs> that's, you know, it's, it's the rules that we operate under. And so um, they should, I think they should be more uniform across agencies. Um, they just are not right now. Truthfully, it's not worth my calling my congressman or <laughs> even the local constabulary. It's just not worth it. <laughs> Yeah, it's frustrating. Anyways, that was all for me. Okay. Um, and for those of you who might be medical providers who are listening in, um, if you have individuals you know, who have traumatic brain injury or any other type of impairment, um, having a doctor with an opinion that they should be on disability is really helpful to your clients. Um, sometimes we, we really have to fight with medical providers to get that written opinion or to get them to fill out forms. And we know that that can really be a pain in the butt, um, but it, it makes a big difference as we're going through the process if, if our clients have supportive medical providers who are willing to back up their application. Um, and you can always, you know, we get calls from medical providers, from psychiatrists, from doctors, referring clients to us and talking about that application. We're always happy to talk with you as a provider as well, or someone who works with a, um, a nonprofit or a disability group. Um, always happy to talk over the phone and, and talk about whether or not we think um, an application is warranted. Um, but I can say that generally, if a doctor calls us or a psychiatrist calls us, and refers or some, even a social worker calls and said, I've got this client, they need to apply for disability. I really think that they should be on the program. We're more likely to take that case because we know that there's someone else who's backing up their claims um, and who's willing to help through the process. So it does make a big difference. And my, 
Um, I'll put my email address in the chat again. Um, feel free to reach out if there are other questions that you just don't want to talk about online. Sure. Or give us a call anytime as well. Again, even if you're not a current client, we're willing to, to help through that process. Oh, here we go. Um, Josie asked about, um, she has several clients who fear the ticket to work program. They feel that if they do any kind of work, even short term for the program, they will automatically be flagged as non-disabled. There's also a common theme that many individuals feel that they will be watched on social media and places they go. Is there anyone that would help with these fears? And she's a VR counselor. Yeah, so let me look at something quick. So it looks like ticket to work is for someone who is already on disability. So we, you know, we don't always see that after you've already been approved for the program. Um, I would say that, you know, it's a realistic fear, but it's probably not warranted. Um, you know, generally speaking, again, those rules are pretty strictly applied. If you're earning under a certain amount or if your earnings are subsidized or if they're short-term and they stop because of your impairments, um, Social Security won't consider that substantial work that counts against your application or against your ongoing benefits. Um, and the, the fear about um, you know, watching, being watched, um, whether on social media or where you're going, um, you know, typically we'll see some anxieties like that with, with our clients who might be dealing with specific mental illnesses. Um, it's, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't help me to say, to help them for me to say it doesn't happen, but, but it, it, you know, it doesn't happen. Social security is absolutely going to be watching where you live, meaning, you know, if you've moved, they need to know that if you've changed jobs, if you do start working, if you have any earnings, if you're paying taxes, they're going to be watching those things through government systems, but there's not any type of like surveillance of your activities online or, or what you're doing on social media. Um, anyone, I mean, as far as helping with those fears, yeah, I mean, that we can talk about the reality of what social security is actually looking at. Um, but I don't know that that necessarily will calm those fears if somebody has that anxiety, but we're happy to talk to someone about what that actually looks like and what it means. But to the, the you know, really wanna em emphasize that first point that you can still be working and qualify for disability. Um, so, it, you know, if you're working part-time because you need to, because most, of, most people don't have savings to last for a long time, um, it's, it's totally normal to be working at some amount and still apply for and receive disability benefits. Got another one, Debbie asks, so if Social Security does not deem you disabled because you are able to do a certain type of work, do they take into account that the pay for that light work may be much less than what you were making prior to the disability? Unfortunately, no. Um, if the earnings are over $1,260 a month, yeah, sorry, <laughs> um, it is considered substantial gainful activity. Um, so just like they don't consider where you live and what jobs are actually available in your, in your residence, in your town, um, they don't look at the type of pay that you received. So, you know, same for me too, as an attorney, if I suddenly became unable to do my work as a lawyer, but I could do other unskilled work, um, I would still not be considered disabled. Um, the only, only distinction is when you get over the age of 50 and then over the age of 55, um, then those, those rules loosen up a little bit about the skill level. Or so the skill level, but the pay doesn't always correlate with that. We have another question from Kylie. Um, she has a client that felt she had to cancel social media because she worried her friends on social media would misinterpret her activities and potentially someone could report her. Is that a valid possibility? Someone calling into SSD and saying they saw someone on Facebook doing such and such? Um, 
I would say no, that that's not a valid possibility, primarily because it's not that easy to just call into Social Security and report something. Um, you know, they tie you to your Social Security number. And so you, if you call in with a name um, and you're not reporting something based on their Social Security number, they, are, they won't, probably won't even take the report. Um, if there are earnings, if you are out actually working and earning money under the table, for example, and not paying taxes on those earnings, so Social Security can't catch it, um, they might report it to like the inspector general or to law enforcement, then that could possibly be a problem if you're actually committing fraud. But no, if you are, you know, doing activities, if you are living your life, somebody can't call Social Security and tell them that no, this person's not actually disabled because I saw them go on vacation or I saw them doing these other activities. So um, I understand the anxiety, but it's, it's not something that Social Security would consider. Anybody else? Questions or situations you want to talk about? I think that's great to even just know that we have you as a resource, you know, to call and ask questions to because I think that's the base thing. I'm sure Nikki, you get all kinds of Nikki answers our phone and uh, I'm yep. sure you get all kinds of people giving you situations that you don't always know how to answer. So yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's always like, do you have somebody that can help you? Okay. <laughs> I don't know those answers, so. Yeah, no, and that's, and yeah, we don't always know the answer, um, but we'll always try to help you find it, um, can do the research. Um, and there is on our website, which is just schneiderlawfirm.com. Um, there's a lot of information about the application as well and some things to think about as you're applying, just some basic information to walk through. Um, probably easier to understand than the presentation I gave today, but it's all there online. Um, no, you did great. That was good. Excuse me, one more thing. Again, yeah. you are saying that you will have your email address mm -hmm. available. Um, yep, I did. I put it in the chat box, but I can also. <clears throat> you know, where to find the chat, JP. It's just along well, your bottom. The reason I wanted that or make sure that I got it was that way I could contact the rest of the, the folks in our group. And if they have questions or whatever, at least they, they can ask them. I'll email it to you right now, okay, JP? All right, thank you. Yep. Um, and yes, Debbie, I'm happy to share a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, so I'll just send it to Carly, if yep. that's okay. And, and then, we'll just put it on our website along with the recording. Oh, Debbie, okay, yep. so you can grab it tomorrow when I, yep. Absolutely. I was gonna ask that too, I think like those charts and things would be good for people to um, watch later, so. Well, we won't take any more of your time if nobody has anything else, but we appreciate your time and absolutely thanks for the invitation. Okay. All right, sounds good. Everybody have a good rest of the day. Thanks, you too. Bye bye. Bye.